Well, thanks for joining us for our August post-diagnostic support group. Those of you who were at the session last week might remember Kieran saying that that was going to be his last session and that um, he was handing over to Chloe and I, so here we are. You might need to bear with us because this is our first one, so we're hoping that it's all going to go okay, um, so fingers crossed that it does. Um, so yeah, just a bit of sort of housekeeping first, I suppose. Um, you might have seen that this month's uh, presentation will be by uh, Dr. Hannah Williamson. Um, so thank you, Hannah, for joining us and for doing the talk today. Um, there will be, uh, throughout the um, presentation, opportunities for you guys to answer questions or get involved. So you can either raise your hand or use the chat box, whatever you prefer. Um, and we can sort of unmute you if you'd, if you'd rather say that verbally. Um, there will be a 15 minute um, sort of break partway through um, where, yeah, we can all sort of uh, uh, comfort break. Uh, yeah, but uh, yeah, and this session is being recorded um, so that people who couldn't make it today can still uh, catch up, but all personal information and faces will be removed from that. So you don't need to worry about that. Um, so yeah, if everyone's ready, then I suppose we'll hand over to Hannah and get started. Okay, hello everyone. Can everyone hear me clearly? Good stuff. Well, just to start, I'm very, very excited to be back. Um, I haven't attended a post-diagnostic support group for a couple of years now, which is a real shame. Um, so yeah, when this opportunity came up to speak to you guys and reconnect with the group a little bit, I was very excited. So I've been looking forward to this very much. Um, and my presentation today is about autism and ageing or autism and, and later life. So I'm just going to share my screen and we'll get cracking. Let's hope this works okay. Can everyone see that screen all right? Get some nods. Yeah, lovely. Okay. So just to start with some introductions then. So my name's Hannah Williamson and I'm a clinical psychologist. And I've been um, qualified for about two and a half years now. Um, I've worked at Axia in, in some capacity um, since I've been qualified, but recently more often, which is very, very good. I'm happy to spend more time at Axia. Um, but I also did a specialist placement with Axia when I was doing my training. Um, and that was in about 2018. And one of my tasks on placement at the time was to do a presentation to the post-diagnostic support group about autism in ageing or autism in older adults. Um, that was one of the tasks Linda, as my supervisor at the time, had set me. Um, so this is just a bit of an update, really, just to think about has anything changed since I did that presentation back in 2018 or what kinds of things might we think together about as a group about this concept of autism and aging. Um, so just to share some disclaimers, I am not autistic and I'm also not aging. I'm not considered in this older adult category. So I'm only 30 and I'm neurotypical. Let's keep this open today and maybe some of the most interesting discussions will be what happens in our in our virtual room today. So along with the introductions, just wanted to share these pictures of me last week in Hebden Bridge and uh, Todd Morden in Yorkshire. Um, and I'm sharing these because these are two of my key interests, <laughs> probably says a lot about me, um, but one of them being hiking and being outside in nature and just really exploring the world in that way. And that's really important to me. Um, and also drinking nice wine and going out for nice meals, which I absolutely love. Um, and the reason I mention these is because these are a couple of my key interests now and things that I really value. But I imagine as I get older and as I move into later life, I can see these being important to me in some capacity. Um, the reason I bring this up is because what I'll talk about later is something called the active ingredient. So what is the active ingredient of these important um, activities? So for me, hiking and being outside in nature, when I'm, I don't know, 80, I'd love to be able to climb up on top of that rock there with my arms in the air, loving life. Um, but what if my mobility is different and what if my respiratory system is different or my heart is different and I can't get up there? Well, then I'd be asking myself, what is what is the active ingredient that makes me feel like I'm living with such good enjoyment and I'm, I'm living a valued life? And it, maybe I can just be outside in nature. 
Um, maybe I can explore, you know, green spaces in other ways. Um, so I might not be getting to the top of the hill, but I might be exploring and meeting that need in another way. So the structure of today, so we're just going to think about ageing and later life in a general sense to start off with. And then we'll be thinking a little bit about how these themes or these concepts relate to autistic people. Um, and I'll invite some of your ideas as we move through. Then we'll have a bit of a brain break. And then we'll come back and have a chat about looking after ourselves in later life and sort of really preparing for that later stage in our lives. And again, it'd just be really nice if we can have some, some open discussion, either in the chat function or um, if you raise your hand, Evie and Chloe can help you out with unmuting you. Okay, so we'll start with language and what I've called eligibility, just because I couldn't think of a better word. Um, so I think historically, I was thinking back to when I was, I don't know, 10 or 11 growing up, the language I heard around me from, um, you know, my mum and my aunties and my nana actually all worked in like health and health and social care services. Um, and this was the language that I heard the news about the people that they were looking after. It was things like pensioner or the elderly. Um, so that was interesting just to sort of reflect back. And, and we don't really, well, I don't hear that language that much anymore. I would say I more so hear things like older adults, older people, and later life. Um, when I was doing some of the sort of research for the update for today, then I, then I realised, you know, the, in America, they tend to use words like senior citizens, which at first I was like, oh, oh, it's a bit cheesy. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe senior in the word, in the sense of the word old, might be quite, um, I don't know, quite offensive, quite discriminatory in some ways. But then I thought, well, what about the other the other meaning of that word senior, you know, as someone in a higher position, someone with more experience. For example, in my line of work, you have senior psychologists, Linda Buchan, who, um, you know, have, have a wealth of experience and, and knowledge under their belts. So I think in that sense, you know, maybe that word senior citizen isn't so bad. Um, currently in the, well, in the UK health system, certainly we call we call people in this later stage of life, older adults. So you have specific teams that are called things like the older adult mental health team. So that tends to be the language, the language these days. Um, and in terms of this word eligibility, um, it tends to be to access services such as older adults mental health teams. The, the eligibility or the cutoff tends to be 65 to access them services which is quite interesting. I don't know, it seems like quite an arbitrary number. I'm not sure. You know, I think it's probably lined up with things like um, retirement age, access to pensions age, that sort of thing. Um, but you'll certainly have many 65-year-olds, 65-year-old plus, who would recoil in horror to hear that they might be in the older adults category. Um, but then on the other hand, you've got, you, you know, you've got some charitable services, I think, that their cutoff is like 50 plus. So much younger people might be identifying themselves as older adults. So there's a lot of sort of subjectivity and, and room for sort of exploration in this, I suppose. Um, just thought I'd share some statistics. I'm sure there's some people in the room that love statistics. Um, I was looking at the Office for National Statistics and they, um, they released a report in 2019. Um, and then there was 13,000 centenarians so people over 100 years. And that number had increased by 11% compared to the previous year. Um, now, I was looking at some projections as well. So, yeah, I like things like this. Um, some of the pro projections say that we're expected to be at something like 21,000 centenarians by 2030 in this country, which is huge. And which means that we've really got to make sure that policy and services are absolutely lined up with looking after our older people. Um, and so another just point on that is that in 2018, a man aged 65 could expect to live for another 18 years, while a woman another 21. So on average, at 65 years, women still have a quarter of their lives left to live. So, you know, I think in the past, like historically, um, when people lived much shorter lives, someone would have been considered perhaps, you know, having a good innings at 65, but we're, we're an aging population, we've got better medical treatment, and people are living much longer. 
So you can't just consider that last that last period as you know um, of five years or something. You know, you've got a, a, almost like a lifetime. If if you reach sixty five, you could still have a lifetime of experience after that. And um, then I've got this sense of you know it is subjective and perhaps you're only as old as you feel. And there's just a lovely little image. I don't know if you can see that. Two people just having a great old time on a water ski, which is grand. Um, okay, so I am going to be this, this presentation really covering a breadth of things, really. Um, and I'm, I'm inviting conversation on, on challenges and difficult experiences, but also positives and also, you know, important meaning making, etc. as we grow older. Um, but I don't want to skirt over this bit, which is that ageing does inevitably come with some challenges. So growing older will, will mean for, for most people some changes in mobility, some changes in sensory stuff. So, for example, um, sight issues or hearing issues it can also mean cognitive changes, feeling tired and having more health problems. Um, discrimination and stigma you know there's something about um i think particularly living in a very western very capitalist society where uh, money and productivity and all of that is is prioritized in terms of your value to society um then people can be quite discriminated against when they reach that later stage in life um it can also come with bereavement and loss and isolation um and, and loss of independence. So, you know, I used to be really independent and completely self-reliant, but suddenly I need this, this extra support. And, and that can be a real difficult transition point for people and a real area um, of, of, of adjustment, adjustment and, and process into something new. Okay. So oh, I'll just pop back to that slide and say, actually, so with all of these sort of dif difficulties and, and, and decline and deterioration, and I suppose that's what this stuff on this page is about, isn't it? It's about losses um, and, and sort of negative change. And pre sort of the 1980s, um, that's what all of the research into ageing generally was about. So it was about, um, right, we, we've got to do, um, you know, geriatric research and, and that tended to be around um, focusing on losses and preventing losses or helping adjustment to losses rather than focusing more on the positive, on the thriving, on the, on the growth, on the self-development that can come with ageing. Um, so the 1980s was, was a sort of turning point, really, in terms of the, the, the paradigm of ageing research and what people were interested in, in looking at. So one of the first shifts was from these people called Roe and Khan in the 1980s, and they came up with a model called successful ageing. Um, I should have got it up, really, because we, I suppose we like a Venn diagram at Axia. So there is a Venn diagram that sort of connects these three main points of continued engagement with life, maintaining physical and cognitive functioning, and minimising disease and disability. And you can imagine those three things in three neat circles, um, with the middle bit of that being, being quantified as, as successful ageing. So this was important research, I suppose, because it did shift it from that, you know, decline, deterioration paradigm into, into more positive shifts. Um, however, I still feel like this, um, things like minimising disease and disability is problematic. And I think actually it's very, now looking at it, it's very ableist. Um, and thinking about you guys and the autistic community, automatically that model of successful ageing excludes autistic people. You know, if, if as an autistic person or a person with ADHD, dyslexia, um, if you consider that to be a disability, then automatically you're excluded. And then what? Automatically you're an unsuccessful ager. Um, yeah, not okay. So there's definitely problems inherent in that model. Um, that has been sort of critiqued now quite a lot in the literature. So it is still cited in the literature on aging. Um, but it's definitely critiqued. Um, and I came across some statistics, actually. Um, let me just have a little look. 
Yes, so lots of, um, not, not in the autistic population, but in the general population, lots of people off the back of this have started investigating and using measures and questionnaires to assess um, where people are matching up to this model. Um, so they've, they've, they've sort of broken down the concept into different areas and, and uh, assessed people to see where they fit along with this sort of barometer of what is successful aging. Um, and in the general population, it's somewhere between 10 and 20, pe 20, 10 and 20 percent of people would fit this model of successful aging. And that's in the general population. So if you can just imagine how many people who are autistic or who have other disabilities, um, how, how, how rare it would be to, to sort of match up to this idea of successful aging. But then there's been sort of much more positive shifts from some, someone called Laslett in the 1980s. And they came up with um, sort of four phases of, of aging through the lifespan. Um, I'll show them on the next page, actually. So we've got the first age, which is um, an era for, for dependence, socialization, immaturity, and learning when we're a child. And then we've got that era for independence, maturity, responsibility, and working. So you've got that's probably spans like adolescence through working age life. And then we've got the third age, which is sort of like the end of working age life through retirement. Um, and it, and it's, it's a real positive sort of way of, of, of sense making of that period of life, you know, an era for, an era for personal achievement and fulfillment after retirement. So I'll just flick back. So the third, the third age, it's conceptualized in these sorts of ways. It's a, it's a time for personal achievement, fulfillment, um, health, vigor, positive attitude. Um, when Lazlitt talked about this initially in the 80s, it was believed to be possible in developed countries, more so than developing countries or underdeveloped countries. So um, there's definitely a, cult a cultural bias in this sort of idea. Um, you know, for example, in the Western society, if we've got money under our belt after retirement to then go traveling and exploring the world or pursuing interests or learning skills, um, you know, uh, impoverished nations might not have that have that luxury. So it definitely feels very, very sort of biased culturally. Um, but, you know, Laslett did um, sort of lead the way in terms of this positive aging research and focus on thriving rather than losses and deterioration. Yeah, so that raises an interesting point, of, you know, again, coming back to culture. Um, I suppose in Western societies, as I said earlier, you know, you can have this focus on, oh, well, how productive is a person in society when they're retired and they're not, you know, adding to taxes in quite the same way or making contributions in quite the same way. Um, and I think that's where we're just really quite rubbish in Western societies. Whereas if you think about, you know, um, lots of countries in Africa, sort of tribal communities, that sort of thing, you've got people who are much older considered um, the pillar of the pillar of the community and a place where people will go for um, advice and guidance and um, just prompting through their through their life, you know, because they're really tapping into all the wisdom that they've got. Um, so again, that's another sort of positive idea of what what aging and later life can mean. It's it's, it's wisdom and having all that life experience to draw upon and, and share with people. Then we've got something called the grandmother hypothesis. I don't know if anybody's heard of that before. Um, I've been quite interested in like sort of research around hormones and, and menopause recently. So I've been listening to a few podcasts and whatnot. And I've, I've come across this grandmother hypothesis and learned that um, humans are amongst one of the you know, very few species of mammal, mammals, might be the only species, it might be other whales or something, who go through the menopause. Most other mammals will continue being able to reproduce for the rest of their lives. Um, and that's got people to thinking, well, why? Why is it important that adults stop being able to produce children? And um, one of the key ideas is that we need older people. We need older women, particularly with experience in how to um, raise offspring in a safe way and to share, you know, to share life experience and mentoring with the youth. And, and the young people, um, and we need older people in order to survive as a, as a species. And um, so again, I just really like all this positive sort of 
uh, spin on, on what older people can add to our society. Okay, I've already done that one. So just thinking about aging and the good stuff then. So, so what is the possibility to, to look forward to or to, to enjoy in this period of our lives? So we've got the third age themes that we've already discussed. Um, but then I was thinking, you know, it's also a time for rest, recuperation and self-care. It can be a time to just stop and pause and reflect, to sort of look back over your life and make some sense as, as to, you know, what's really mattered to you and, 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 you know, what you've brought to life and the people around you. It's a time for more interests. So, you know, retirement age or, you know, um, children moving on and being more independent and just having more time to yourself might mean more time for interests and hobbies, activities, which can be really restorative um, and helpful for our mental health. Um, a time for more travel and exploration if we wanted to. Personal maturity, perhaps less stress and responsibility. You know, I was reading through, um, I'm sure some of you might have read Sarah Hendricks's book of Women and Girls on the Spectrum. And I was just having another flick through that um, recently. And it, it reflects on sort of being a grandmother in, later on in the book, being a grandmother and how sort of freeing that can feel as an autistic woman. You know, you've, you've, you've raised your children. And while that's been, you know, potentially very rewarding, it's also very, very stressful and very stressful on the sensory system and, you know, not being able to get your self-care in. However, when you become a grandmother, you've got time for sort of, imparting your knowledge and wisdom and all that stuff but it's time limited and you can get rid of them and kick them out when you need to and when you've reached your limit um yeah and then I was also thinking there's also you know along with wisdom you've really amassed a lifetime of skills and experience and and knowing yourself and um knowing what works and what doesn't in terms of your coping ability um I'm just going to pause there and see if anyone else has got anything to add to that based on what they might be looking forward to or already experiencing as an older person. You know, what is the good stuff? Has anyone got anything they'd like to bring? No, that's okay. This is a lovely phrase I heard from my nana last week when I was on the phone to her. Um, she said, it's great when you're older. No one tells you off except your kids and your doctors. <laughs> So there's something about perhaps growing older, that means you can just get away with a bit more. And I think that might be quite handy for the autistic community. You know, there is a, a sense of directness and honesty and truth, um, speaking your mind, um, not having that, that sort of neurotypical social filter um, and those sort of social faux pas and whatnot. Well, when people get older, People sort of expect that. Oh, they're older. That's all right. You know, so my nana says she just gets away, gets away with all sorts now, which I imagine, you know, for some people on the spectrum, that, that might be really handy. Oh, and I put that in because she is just really naughty and full of life, my nana. <laughs> so much so, actually, we have to keep telling her off. Um, she should have put grandkids in there as well because she keeps like um, undertaking big cleaning projects in the house and she'll be like, um, legs akimbo on the kitchen worktops, like cleaning the tops of them and stuff. I'm like, Nana, you're 85. Get down. Um, but yeah, she's willful. She's willful. She won't listen. Okay. So let's have a little bit of, a bit of a think about aging and the spectrum then. So just put down some considerations here. And I'm happy for people to sort of chime in as I, as I move through these. So, so in terms of change in transition. So getting older is inevitably a time of change in transition, whether that's, you know, having to change house to somewhere without stairs, whether that's, you know, um, loss of loved ones, whether that's going through body changes, health-wise or, or perhaps through the menopause, you know, it's inevitably a time of change, which understandably for people on the spectrum, it's going to be potentially an added challenge. However, the opposite might also be true. You know, neurotypical people uh, potentially don't have uh, the vast experience that autistic people do in handling big change, in being able to manage big change. So in some ways, autistic people, when they've reached later life, might be really equipped and really well-resourced to deal with this. 
especially with the life experience of knowing themselves over all of them years. I'm just going to pause there and see Helen's raised her hand. Helen, do you want to contribute? Oh, yes. Yeah, sorry, sorry to interrupt you here. Um, uh, when you started this with your slide, you were talking about um, 65 plus as almost being a kind of cut off age of like, you know, almost forgetting people. When you're talking about ageing with autism, what is the kind of beginning age of what is considered older ageing yeah. and autism? It's a really interesting question. I don't think I don't think it's an easy answer. You know, as I was doing this, I was thinking, OK, well, you know, services for older people often start at 65. However, some of the some of the conditions or, you know, health difficulties that might come that are usually synonymous with older age um, might start at a much younger age, for example, mm. um, early onset dementia. Mm. So if someone with early onset dementia, I don't know, late 40s, early 50s. Um, they might start a rapid period of, of decline around that age and, and yet they don't quite fit into older adult services. However, their experience might feel much older. Right. So, so you're saying the 65 plus is when it's when older services start. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, so I, I misunderstood. I thought you were saying that they finish at 65 and then people get, okay. No, not right. yet. So it's, yeah, six, gotcha. it's, it's right. usually 65 plus. Right. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, I think the point I was making, Helen, was it's, it's, it seems quite arbitrary you know because mm-hmm. some, some 65 year olds <laughs> might be absolutely full of life and not have any difficulties whatsoever whereas you might have much much younger people who might have health difficulties cognitive mm-hmm. difficulties perhaps much more synonymous with with older age yeah it's yeah. quite a hard thing to make sense of isn't it yeah okay thank you for that <laughs> yeah you're welcome um okay so then we've got things like hobbies and interests um now I think what one thing that might set autistic people in good stead is we often know how to, I'm saying we, you, often know how to occupy your time. (laughs) You know, you're quite used to really getting down and and really into things and really engrossed in things and really spending your time wisely in the things that really matter to you um, and not investing so much time in the things that don't. And now I think that for some people, neurotypical people, that might reach retirement age, have all this free time on their hands and be like, what do I fill it with? However, you know, lots of autistic people, people on the spectrum might be like, yes, I've got all this time to fill with, I don't know, computer coding or gardening or knitting or drawing, whatever it is. Um, So I think potentially, you know, you might be well placed to to manage that time in later life. Um, Retiring. So, you know, for some, this is, obviously going to be very variable for anyone so retiring can come with real challenges in that you know you might have a lot of value tied up in your work um and therefore then leaving work might leave people at a bit of a loss identity wise what does this mean for me now however for other people it might be oh my gosh work has just been i don't know 40 plus years of absolute stress sensory hell small talk at the printer and I don't have to do that anymore and that might just be really refreshing and and welcome for many many people um I've put demands and executive functioning in there I suppose that that maybe ties up with work you know if you're balancing in your working life if you're balancing work and family life looking after the house and um and all of your health appointments all at once spinning plates um putting work to one side might just mean you've got enough space to focus on them things that really matter in terms of your well-being um, and you might find that you can function a bit better um, obviously anxiety might be if work is a real key stressor then anxiety might be really reduced um, for some people and, and therefore functioning much better uh, I've already sort of talked about this one about the social four pars and potentially getting away with more as we get older which um, might be very welcome Then we've got hormones. So, um, you know, of course, we've got things like menopause for older women. Um, And while that can come with a whole range of challenges, of course it can. You know, we know for some people that can mean um, bigger fluctuations in emotions. It can mean heightened sort of sensory experiences, um, uh, difficult relationships with our bodies. You know, for other people, it might be a real time of relief. You know, if you're someone who... I don't know, has had crippling period pains your whole life, um, has really struggled with the sensory side of 
um, of having a period of menstruating, then it might be a real relief to then know, oh gosh, you know, I don't have to worry about that anymore. Um, this was a really nice paper that you can access. You know, there's, there's open access online if anyone was interested. It's called, it's by Caravidas and Visser. Um, and, and it's released this year. It's not just in my head and it's not just irrelevant. And it's about autistic women's experience of the menopause. And I suppose much like this presentation, yes, it really encapsulates some of the challenges that people experience in a very real way. Uh, but it also talks about it being a sort of period of growth and a period of learning um, and just sort of, you know, a real, a, a real point to stop and say, I actually can't keep on pushing myself into situations that aren't going to serve me. Uh, now is the time. My body is telling me things and I have to listen to it. And then this being a sort of turning point for people uh, in terms of looking after their well-being and looking after their, their body and their physical health. So that's quite a nice paper for any, any women or, or men that were interested in, in learning. Um, obviously, for many people who are aging or growing older on the spectrum, it might be at this point in their lives that they either seek a diagnosis or you know, perhaps their children or grandchildren get diagnosed and they start to self-reflect and, and look at themselves. Um, so I, this is a really unique uh, factor of aging when you're on the spectrum. It, it's it's uh, you know, if, if you reach this realization or this eureka moment that this is why I'm different or this is who I am, you know, reaching that in later life, you know, yes, there might be some sadness about uh, why I didn't have this earlier and, and what if I'd have had this earlier. However, at least then I think oftentimes when I work with people in assessments, uh, you know, maybe if I meet them again for a follow up or therapy, for example, then they'll tell me, you know, I've been able to look back over my whole life and just reframe it and be kinder to myself and, and not give myself a hard time. And, you know, it, it's a real positive framework for self-understanding. Um, and I think that's a, a really unique uh, concept or idea for, for autistic people on the spectrum. Then also we've got things like care homes and hospitals, you know, if health or, or cognition or mental health is deteriorating, then sadly some people might have these experiences. Um, which, you know, inevitably, uh, ooh, if we think about how services are run right now, there's a long way to go in terms of them meeting the needs of autistic people. Um, but actually, later on in the presentation, what I'll do is I'll come to some things that might help us prepare for that stage in our lives. And, you know, let's hope that we, we don't end up in that situation um, and that we can look after ourselves in a proactive way to perhaps buffer against some of it. Um, but it's good to prepare. We know that. And there's some ways and means of, of getting our, our needs written down very clearly so that if that time comes, then we can be looked after in the best way possible. Um, another thing I was thinking about is this idea of around resilience. So autistic people are amongst the most resilient people I've ever met. Um, I'm, I'm every day just amazed by what people have gone through and coped with. Um, so, you know, coping with change, coping in, in a world that isn't primarily set up for them, um, dealing with mental health and learning what helps and what hinders and, um, and dealing with changes and, and, and life transitions and, and things outside of our control. You know, if there's a, if there's a group of people that have experienced them things um, and, and navigated their way through them, it's autistic people. So, so by the time you reach that later stage in life, you, you hopefully will have this breadth of experience um, in order to draw from. Is there any questions or any thoughts at this point that anyone might want to add or share? If that is a no, I'll just, I can't see Evie or Chloe. No, okay. Oh, Kathy, I can see Kathy. Hi, Kathy. Oh. Hi, can you hear Hello. me? Yes, I can, very clear. Um, I just wanted to say really that um, it is very, very positive what you've said, which I can understand um, why you want to project the positivity because we don't all want to think, right, well, what's the point? Um, but also, um, I think it's important to remember the practicalities that 
somebody with a disability is already disadvantaged for preparing for older age because we won't perhaps have the earning potential through barriers or what other things could be there um, and therefore the potential to amass a pension and things like that is reduced um, and I think as well yeah resilience but um, I'm autistic I'll never understand people you know it doesn't matter how long I've lived I don't think I'm going to gain any more insight into how people work so um, I, you know that, that's just what I wanted to say really I'm 56 and I'm retired not out of choice and you're dead right making that transition from feeling um worthwhile and you know having a purpose to um being sort of chucked on the scrap heap is big and I haven't got around my head around that at all yet mm -hmm. and in terms of less stress I don't think I think it just changes to a different stress not to put a massive negative on this because obviously working was too hard to do for my body mm. but you know I've still got grown-up children that still need help now I've got older re relatives that need help and I'm in the middle trying to look after myself so I think it just changes and yeah you change rise to the channel and challenge but I don't think there is this clear oh yeah you get to a certain age and you don't have stress anymore yeah, that's all yeah. I, want no, say, I, yeah. I absolutely agree yeah thank you so much for raising that um there was something I came into it very mindful about today Kathy I think I, I was reflecting back to the um the presentation you know the one in 2018 that I did on this and there was a sort of sense at that time that it was a sort of bit too negative and a bit too doom and gloomy <laughs> um so I thought oh okay I'll take I'll take that feedback and I'll try and just, but it's, it, as ever with these things it's a bit of a pendulum of course and and I'll absolutely invite I think the, the experiences you've just shared there Kathy are really really important um, and we can use space at the end of today to 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 see about other people's experiences and and, and sharing that and you know if anyone's got any words of wisdom to share with one another in a, in a really supportive way um and you know we can open that up and and similarly as we move through this presentation everyone um you know it, if you want to counter and I really invite what Kathy's just said and if you want to counter anything I've said or or put a different spin on things then then please do you know I'm really welcome to that so thank you very much Kathy. Okay so here's a paper by um what I never know how to say this word I mean so I think it's Wang or Wang um now I did present this one at the last at the last presentation um and I, again I was hoping that there was perhaps some, some, some more stuff, uh, some more qualitative research to build upon this, but there's not a lot going on, sadly. Um, which, you know, going back to this point of, you know, it's not all, it's not all rosy. Uh, one of the big problems at the moment is that autistic older adults are being excluded through research. Um, and, you know, what does that tell us in terms of how we're valued in society? So that's certainly an area that really, really needs to be looked into. Um, so... So this paper in 2017, it, um, I think they interviewed 15 autistic adults and nine carers of autistic adults. Um, now, this is where sort of Helen's question earlier about when is older adults comes into it, because sadly, in this paper, the, the average age was 50, which isn't really sort of older adults. Um, I would consider that probably more middle age now, you know, especially if, if people are living much longer. Um, but, you know, regardless, some of the things that they come up with, um, this group of autistic adults about what would it mean to them to be ageing well? What do they need from themselves and other people to age well um, and to protect against some of these um, difficulties and discrimination and, and marginalisation that people experience? What do we need to protect against it? So some of the themes were myself, being autistic, others lifestyle and living well, being supported, relating to others, life environment and societal attitudes and acceptance. Now, again, this paper, if you wanted to read it, um, is freely available. So if you just search sort of ageing autism and then that name and year, you can, you can find the whole article and really find the, the quotes that, that people have, have brought to the table. Um, I don't have time to go into it today, but, you know, some of the things are, for example, um, myself, 
um, related to people feeling that they had um, a greater sense of peace and some identity and um, some growth in their personal identity and, and, and greater power and control as, as they've developed and that they hoped for that as they continued to age. Um, being autistic was about, um, often people talked about the power of diagnosis in adulthood and later adulthood, which is what we discussed earlier. Um, and the power of insight into sensory needs and strategies, um, and that being a really important um, factor for people. So knowing my body, knowing what works for me and what doesn't, um, knowing what's okay not to push myself into situations that are just going to be sort of traumatic from a sensory point of view. Um, then others, um, there was a, a sense that people wanted a small number of really fulfilling relationships, not really massive networks of people, um, but company, company plus independence, this sort of balance. Um, then we've got lifestyle and living well, which is about people feeling healthy in their body, having choices about their life, um, having good occupation, a good home and enough time on their interests. And that for some people was, was what aging well would really um, be encapsulated by. Then there was things like being supported, which you know, relates to services. And, and of course, services aren't set up in the best way at the moment, but there's, there's a way to go. Um, so people want good access to healthcare with skilled providers and people who really get it. Um, yeah, I think in the UK, we've definitely got a way to go in, in that sense. But, you know, we need, we need more research to start feeding into policy and that feeding into service change. Then we've got relating to others. So people wanted the right people who understand them and suspend judgment and people who try and understand me and really put that effort in. But there's some beautiful, beautiful quotes in this paper if you look to it. So what, uh, one quote was something like, um, I want to enjoy the right people in brief and limited circumstances, preferably by appointment, which I just thought was beautiful. Um, but they also talked about this need for, for solitude, but not isolation, and those two things being very, very discreet and different. Um, so solitude, you know, I need that time on my own in order to recharge from the stresses of the world, but I don't need isolation. They're two very different things. Yes, I might need time on my own, but I need to know I've got people around me to support me. Um, and then we've got life environment, which is about um, open and accepting societies. And I think this really uh, links into what you were saying, Cathy, you know, society isn't set up for older adults as it stands. Um, and that is what, 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 what the autistic people in this sample really wanted, a space where, you know, we can fit in and be ourselves and we're supported by policy and we're supported by law. Um, and then we've got things like... Um, societal attitudes which again links into that so just better education across healthcare systems and care homes and all of these spaces that older adults are going to potentially occupy in in later life has anyone got any thoughts on any of that that they'd like to share just wait a few moments to see if we have any hands up no Okie doke. All right. So we've got ageing and the spectrum. So we know that with any ageing population, any ageing group of people, that brain and cog cognitive functioning do decline. They just do. Um, and that is regardless of neurotype. But there are individual and group differences, and some people are less at risk and some people are more at risk. And of course, lifestyle factors can be absolutely huge in, in determining where people might end up or, or buffering against some of the risks. Um, now, when you do literature searches around autism and dementia, there's not a lot of research at all. Um, and I think most of the research that is there, it, it often tends to be around um, dementia in people with like a learning disability and autism, not autism without a learning disability. Now, that raises the question why? why is there this absolute paucity of research? And I suppose, you know, one, one explanation is that research into autism and ageing generally is poor. Um, so it makes sense then that autism and dementia would be a, a gap in the literature. Um, but then, again, just to share, I shared this at the last, um, at the last presentation, um, and I hope it's okay for me to share again now, Linda. You might want to chime in on this, but 
Linda's worked in autism services for about 40 years, if not more. And it's, I think, very few, if not none, um, individuals she's worked with who have autism and, and dementia. And if so, they might have had a learning disability as well. Am I right in saying that, Linda? Well, she might have scooted off. She might not be with us. Oh, yeah, you're just on mute. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was just thinking that as you were saying it, you know, I've had the privilege to see people from very young ages, and as you say, 40 years on. So I would have expected to at least have met people now with, with pre senile dementia. And oh, quite some people have faded from my life, and I don't know why. So that could be the case. Mm -hmm. But I actually, I can't think of anyone, even with a learning disability apart from somebody who had down syndrome and autism mm. um and we know that down syndrome does seem to have um you know the precursor to pre-senile dementia but other than that no i think it seems i, I, I was hoping you were going to say like the newcastle studies and these other studies were starting to find that there was a protective factor Mm. Uh, that being autistic was a protective factor for dementia, which I suspect, but that's only anecdotal. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. You, put, you I haven't found any of the research from the from the Newcastle study as yet. I don't know if there's right. anything. I couldn't find it, um, but yeah, that was definitely on my mind. But yeah, we'll move on to that. I mean, I think uh, just to thanks for sharing that, Linda. Um, you know, one potential, like I said, one potential explanation might be we haven't got the research because. People aren't looking into this research because mm. you know, perhaps they're more focused on uh, childhood, you know, autism in childhood. And that definitely is the case. You know, um, in the last presentation, you can find it on our on our YouTube page, on, on Dream's YouTube page, I think. But there's a graph and, you know, like it literally goes like that in terms of age and the number of studies published. It's a real sort of stark negative correlation. Um, so that's potentially one reason. But um definitely moving on to the, the sort of research about brain functioning, another potential reason could be being autistic can be a protective factor against cognitive decline and dementia. So we've got things like um, neuroplasticity or hyperplasticity or the idea of cognitive reserve. So neuroplasticity is the brain's ability to adapt, make new pathways and reorganize in response to experience and stimuli. Now, one of the well, sort of emerging theory, which again needs more research, but there's something about hyperplasticity in autistic brains where there is more plasticity, more ability to adapt and make new pathways and remold and reshape than in the neurotypical population. So if you can imagine if you're a new, neurotypical person, your, hyper, your plasticity level is sort of hit here, you age, and then you might, if, say if this is like a line of... Um, uh, functioning sort of where you might need a lot more help and support for example uh, and lose some independence if you're neurotypical uh, your hyperplasticity is here you've not got a long way to go before you need a lot of extra support but if you're autistic and your hyperplasticity is up here then you know you might shoot down to here but you still be sort of functioning okay so there's something about like bigger brains more malleable brains um, more, uh, brains more hyper-connected in autism, that can be quite protective against um, cognitive decline and aging. There's also something called cognitive reserve, um, which here is the brain's ability to improvise and fi find alternative ways of getting a job done. And it's developed by a lifetime of education and curiosity to help your ba brain better cope with failure and decline. The greater the reserve, the greater the protection against brain changes before observable changes are noticed. Now, as I was reading that, I was thinking, have I met a group of people who are better able to improvise and find alternative solutions to things, and or that have better levels of curiosity, thirst for knowledge, that sort of thing? No, you know, that, that's, that's what amazes me every day about working with autistic people. It's that level of, you know, um, problem solving, novel problem solving, curiosity, you know, wanting to amass information and make, make sense of information. Um, 
there's potentially something about that thinking style that really protects people against the effects of aging and dementia. Now, don't take this as absolute fact. Um, you know, of course, there will be people out there in the world who are autistic and have dementia. However, there does seem to be evidence pointing towards the fact that this is a really helpful thing. I'm just going to show a little quick video if people are up for that. Let's see if it works. Here we go. Can people see that? Yeah, that's better. Wonderful. Helping hand. Observe. We all know people who are really resilient. Okay, so that was um, focused on MS, but I feel like you could have easily sort of swapped in um, just general cognitive decline, general aging, or, you know, things like dementia into that, and it would, it would still make sense. And I think, you know, all of the general research, not, not autistic focus, but general research um, into, sort of, not, not research, more advice into aging well is around, you know, keep your brain active, keep your body active. Um, learn new things, um, stick with your interests, challenge yourself, all that sort of thing. And I think these sorts of activities or, you know, capacity to, to manage these sorts of activities are sort of often inbuilt and inherent to many autistic thinkers. Um, so I do think that it's a really important concept, this idea of, of cognitive reserve. Um, I'm just going to show you a couple more things and then we'll take a break. Okay. Everyone see okay? Yeah. So I think we've pretty much covered all that, to be honest. Um, but just to share, there's also a little mini review by Happy and Charlton from 2012, which sort of summarizes quite nicely here what I was saying. So in aging individuals with autism, um, variations in intelligence might have a significant impact on how reserve interacts with age-related cognitive declines. So intelligence is a big factor in autism, um, but something about like the larger brain volume, that hyperplasticity, the connections um, can be protective of, of typical age related brain changes. But again, they absolutely um, conclude that more research is needed. It's just a very, a very sort of scarce area at the moment. Um, but there's some other areas here. Um, that there's been quite quite a few studies here. If you can see down the bottom, Lever is a key one who pops up a few times. Uh, someone called Gertz who pops up a few times. Um, and across, I'm sort of pulling together some of the themes that come out, and it says things like um, some abilities decline less in aging autistic people than those who are neurotypical. So things like phonemic fluency. So being able to so if I said to you, how many words can you come up with the letter F in a minute, and then you know. Autistic people can be better at that than neurotypical people um, longer in later life. Um, working memory declines less in many people. Visual memory declines less in, in many people. Um, and those, I mean, working memory actually, less so, but often what I hear in assessments is people's visual memory is incredible. Um, I, wonder what, I wonder what would happen in terms of long-term memory. Because I would say most of the time what I hear in assessments from people is that my long-term memory is exceptional. My working memory is more difficult, um, especially on things that don't interest me. So I'd be really interested to know ooh, what happens to people's longer-term memory as, as they age. Maybe that's a, a, a gap for the research. Um, people can be better or have like less decline in things like digital, uh, digit symbol tests, finding patterns and things in numbers, um, which I think isn't surprising. Um, and category learning. Another thing is that theory of mind difficulties become less apparent in autistic people in some of the research. I don't think that's, that's is that to do with brain changes. I think it's probably to do with experience um, over the years and, and experience observing people and using sort of powers of analysis and, and, and coding of the social world to make sense of what's going on, perhaps noticing patterns over the years. When someone does that, that's usually what they mean. When someone when someone's face does that, that's usually what they mean. Um, it's probably a pattern of learning. However, that probably keeps the mind young. It's probably a, a really good sort of brain activity um, that keeps the mind working and ticking and um, maybe adds to some of that cognitive reserve. Oh, I'm trying to get my 
Okay, so guys, if we take a break now, what time are we on? So it's one o'clock. Maybe if we come back at, what time do you think, Chloe and Evie? Quarter past? Yeah, I would have said quarter past is fine, yeah. Get a drink or something. Yeah, so everyone, yeah, just help yourself to a drink and, and the loo, and we'll see you at quarter past one. Okay, so should we get started? Yeah, I'll share my screen again. Everyone see that okay? Give me a nod. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Carl. That was a very enthusiastic nod. Um, okay, so just thinking about um looking after ourselves as we get older. You know, this is as we said, this is inevitably a time of change, of transition, of body changes and brain changes. So so what can we do for ourselves to, to help to help us manage, I suppose. Um, so I put here what to let go of or limit. Obviously, some of these things we can't let go of completely, um, but maybe we want to keep an eye on how much we're doing them, monitor them, reduce them a little in order to prioritise well-being. Um, so one thing might be um, neurotypical conventions and expectations. You know, I think in some of the literature, um, particularly around like autistic women and masking, um, lots of women are talking about as they get older, feeling less pressure to mask. Um, and feeling more able to, um, you know, be their authentic selves. And, you know, if people don't want to be around for that, if people aren't into that, then, you know, maybe they're not the right people to have in their lives. Um, so, yeah, maybe if there's opportunity to, obviously this is a, it's a fine balance, especially if, you know, you're an autistic person in a neurotypical, predominantly neurotypical family, um, then you're not just going to go, all oh, right, I'm off with all your, your neurotypical people. Um, but yeah, maybe, you know, if, if there's a lot of pressure in your life around, you know, socialising, going to the pub when you're not really a drinker, you know, perhaps there's um, perhaps there's work-related social events that people can feel pressure to in working age. And then, you know, when we retire, we don't have to go to that place where everyone's just binge drinking all of the time, for example, or, you know, being really drunk and annoying. Um, you know, maybe there's a space when we re reach later life to go, you know what, I'm going to do what's right for me. I'm not going to sort of conform to these expectations that, that the majority, the neural majority are doing. Um, as I said earlier, with that sort of um, self-diagnosis and self-insight and, and perhaps, you know, looking back over your life and being less hard on yourself, um, you know, perhaps there's a, it's a time to let go of some of that self-criticism or being, you know, being really self-attacking um, maybe it's a time for for being more compassionate to yourself and you know hopefully come into spaces like this where people can share experiences and you can learn actually it's okay to be me um, I'm sadly in a, in a world where the predominant neurotype is 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 neurotypicalness um, you know that that world is is different to the way I think but I've got a community I've got a tribe of people and I'm okay the way I am um, as I said right at the beginning, you know, finding this active ingredient, you know, so if we could try and let go of, of what might be like unrealistic expectations for activity, I know that might be quite hard for an autistic thinker where we might, you know, be quite uh, black or white in our thinking style or all or nothing in our thinking style, you know, so for example, if I can't climb that mountain, then that's it, I'm not going out. Um, but I think if, if we were to take that approach, we, we might quite quickly decline, you know, physically and mentally. Um, so just trying to find what is that active ingredient? Uh, what is the thing or the couple of things that, that, that really sort of help me to feel safe and secure and happy in that activity? And how can I get it in a different way? If I'm not climb, climbing a mountain, can I be walking in the woods? Or can someone be pushing me around in the woods in a wheelchair if I'm, if I'm now a, a wheelchair user? You know, how, how can I have that need met in a different way? Um, just having a look to see what sort of habits, behaviours, patterns of behaviours that you've maybe used that aren't serving you anymore as an older adult um, and that aren't helping you to sort of look after your, your brain health, whether that's, I don't know, uh, again, pushing yourself into situations that don't suit your sensory needs or that are causing you a lot of stress. You know, how can we make adaptations around that to, to help us to feel healthier and, and safer? I'll open this up to you guys now. Has anyone found anything or does anyone hope to do anything as they get older that they're sort of, you know, letting go of things, limiting things that might be really helpful for their mental health, their physical health? Is there anything that people have, have learned or would like some advice around? No? 
okay. That's okay. If anything comes up, then do just put up a hand. I can see it and we can uh, come back to this. Okay. So in terms of supporting ourselves as we grow older, what, what might we do a bit more of? So the last was about limiting stuff or, or stopping stuff, um, avoiding stuff. But what about, what can we do more of, of to help ourselves? So um, sorry to be boring, but, you know, exercise and diet, uh, they're key things to sort of help us. You know, when I was, uh, when I did an older adults placement, it sounds really cheesy, this, what's good for the head, what's good for the heart is good for the head. But it really stuck with people. Like I did a, older adults placement where we did um, a group for people with mild cognitive impairment. So it, it's where you've got decline in your memory, but you're not quite at the level of, of dementia. It's a, it's a risk factor for dementia, but not everyone goes on to develop full-blown dementia. Um, and that was like a, a sort of motto for the group. What's good for the heart is good for the head. Um, so if we can do things to look after our cardiovascular system, it really helps our brain health. And that will really help for that sort of cognitive reserve that we talked about earlier. Um, then we've got brain health. So um, we are the architects of our own brains. So like we said earlier, we know, we know that neuroplasticity exists and we know that uh, autistic people have hyperplasticity. Um, so, you know, there's, uh, there's more opportunity for this, you know, continuing learning and molding and shaping of our brains. So just keep that up. Just keep up that, you know, if you've got a thirst for knowledge or a real curiosity or you like challenging yourself or learning new things, amassing information, then just keep doing that sort of um, challenge in order to keep the, the brain really active. Um, other things that might be helpful to help us have sort of successful aging, whatever that means to you, it might be um, assertiveness and boundaries. You know, we might we might learn as we age what what does and does not work for us. Um, Interest and self care. You know, we might have more time on our hands to, to look after to look after ourselves and, and do the things that are going to make us feel good. However, just going back to what Kathy said earlier, um, that very much depends on personal circumstances. Because as we get older, people will go, "Ah, you're not working anymore. Perhaps you've got more time then to to help this with this caring role or with this um, activity, for example." Um, Socialise on a level that feels comfortable for you. So just going back to that research earlier by Huang, um, you know, some connection and some solitude, would that suit you? But not isolation. You know, we don't want to feel isolated, but solitude might be important for us in balance with other stuff. Um, perhaps having a good routine might be really helpful for us in later life uh, to keep us feeling healthy and safe. Um, and perhaps we can use our skills in research and planning um, in maintaining that for ourselves as we grow older. I'll come back to that in a minute at the end. Um, and a good sensory diet. Um, you know, sensory needs will change and adapt and fluctuate as we grow older. As I said earlier, you know, if we're female, um, our hormones might really affect our uh, sensory system as we, as we go through the menopause. So just keeping sort of abreast of that and, and noticing, you know, documenting what you're noticing, you know, maybe you monitor it and, and learn new things about your body and how you interact with the environment and really make changes that suit you. Um, and then planning for the future and advanced decisions. So, you know, hopefully, hopefully some of this research is true in that autistic people are very protected against things like uh, dementia and, and cognitive decline. But how about planning for the just in case? How about having the contingency plans in place? If I get older and, you know, I lose my ability to communicate a bit more or I lose my ability to problem solve a bit more, um, then how can I document now what I want and I don't want in my later life, how I want to be looked after? What, what, what I value, what are my core values, and how can people like organize my care around those values? It might be important just to get some of those things written down and, and shared with family and friends. Again, I'll open this up. It's okay if nobody's got anything to share, but has anyone got any words of wisdom about you know, what they've done more of when they've got older that's really helped them? Oh, someone's put pacing is a good skill to learn, Kathy's put. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, we can have this sort of um, boom and bust. I don't know if anyone's heard of that sort of uh, concept before. It's often used in like physical health settings. If people have um, like chronic pain or, or chronic fatigue, 
that sort of, those sorts of issues. People often talk about like, we can get into this cycle of, oh, I feel really good. I'm going to do loads. <laughs> I feel really good. I've got loads of spoons. If people use the idea of spoon theory, um, I'm going to do loads while I've got all this energy, but then we might phew, absolutely crash. And then I'm just wiped out and burnt out for days and days on end. So yeah, I really like that idea, Kathy, of, of pacing. That sounds really important. Yeah, and I've got two hands raised. So Chloe, Evie, can I? Yeah, I think we've got Helen first, so I'll just unmute her. Fantastic. Hi, Helen. Oh, hello. Hi. Um, uh, yeah, no, I was just going to say that um, one thing is that to, uh, to kind of focus on the body parts that still do work <laughs> and trying to find things that will kind of resonate with you. Because I'm obviously I'm 40, so I'm not in this kind of older thing, but I've got chronic health issues and have done for the last 15, 20 years. Mm. So I don't really fit with um, people my own age, really, because so a lot of my friends are kind of 72 type touch you know, because we have actually more in common. Um, but so so I think just trying to find as things as you lose, the, I think the kind of pervading feeling for me is just like loss a lot of the time that you lose. Um ability and you just keep on losing things and you keep on losing things and you have to have quite a lot of resourcefulness and resilience to try and keep finding the new things that you can take that will help you um and so that might be for me just trying to figure out um which body parts are still <laughs> intact and still can do something and most of the time it's to do with my mind so I'm trying to kind of like find things that will um engage with me if that makes sense but will be um helpful I don't know if that is to do with really what we're talking about. I hope it is. I, hope I, it makes think, some sense. I think it's absolutely relevant. I think, yeah, yeah. It's, it's completely relevant to this and really, really good advice, I think. Um, I'm sure there'll be people in the group that can that can take a lot from that. I was thinking about a guy um, who I worked with who uh, he was an avid rock climber and he, lo he loved rock climbing. And I was thinking, he wasn't autistic, but I was thinking, okay, so he lost a lot of his function. He wasn't able to do rock climbing anymore. But what if that was an autistic man and what if there was something sensory about about rock climbing, what if there was something about the proprioceptive feedback or the feeling the weight of his body on his arms or something, and maybe there's a way of, of doing something there, like resistance bands or something, sitting down, you know? That, that's what I mean by that, you know, active ingredient sort of stuff. Okay, I can't quite do that, but what can I do that might meet that need? Yeah, I think that's a really important point, Helen, so thanks for sharing. Has someone else got their hand up? Linda, yeah? Mm -hmm. Oh, you're on mute. Linda, you're on mute. Okay. Is that all right now? Yeah. So it sort of follows on from what Helen said about body parts. <laughs> and um, so I am in the category, I'm 68 this year. And those of you who know me know that I'm dyspraxic, developmental coordination disorder. So for me, there, there aren't as many losses. So I've never been able to ride a bike. So that's not going to be a loss. I've never been able to climb a mountain. So none of that's going to be a loss. One of the things, I've no scientific evidence for this, but I've, I've seen a lot of older people, non, non neurotypical older people, for want of a better expression, where when they've fallen over, that's almost been like the beginning of their decline. So with my own grandmother, who was incredibly fit, well, cognitively able when she got knocked over that was it really it was that one incident that sort of made her I don't know whether it made her feel completely vulnerable but she was wrecked after that really um, and I've seen that with a lot of older people and I'm wondering for me falling over has been part of my life forever and so I've got this notion that so if I fall over at this age it's not going to be catastrophic. It's not going to be unusual. And also, because I'm aware, I was thinking about your, your nana who's climbing up on the, on the stall and stuff like that. Now, I would never do that now because I know I'm destined to fall over. So I'm wondering if there's two things, whether if you're used to falling over, bumping into things, do we become more cautious as we get older so there's less falling and if we do fall is it not as catastrophic and therefore not putting us into a decline that's a question really i've not there's no scientific evidence it's a sample of me um. yeah it's really interesting though and i feel like you know there's uh 
thinking about the gaps in autism literature, it's 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 also huge in dyspraxia, isn't it, Linda? And, um, yes, it is. It is. I think thankfully over the last few sort of weeks and months, you've seen it cropping up in like the Guardian articles and, and yeah, you know, on the BBC. So hopefully that that's gaining a bit of traction, and and hopefully there'll be a there'll be task forces and and people leading research in this area in the future. Um, but yeah, it's really interesting, isn't it? Mm. There's someone the else. Only other- Sorry, can I just add about the advanced decisions? I think it's, um, I spoke to one mother who realised her father was probably autistic and he'd gone into a nursing home and a lot of what he was showing, they put down to dementia when in fact his routines and things had always been with him. And if they'd have listened to the family, they would have known that wasn't an indicator of dementia. It was a long-standing thing. So I totally agree with you about getting your advanced decisions about what is important to you now and that can't then be put down to dementia. Yes, yes, that's yeah, really, really good advice, yeah. So if we um, maybe move this on then, because I think, oh, so I'll, I'll cover this section now and then we'll move on to sort of planning and, and what, what might we need to communicate on paper to help people understand okay. us in the event of, of us needing sort of extra care. Um, but first of all, sort of how can others help? Um, so there's things about um, you know friends and family respecting your boundaries and needs, um, understanding and taking the time to listen and support. Then you also might need practical support, such as two appointments or making a reasonable adjustments plan, which we'll come on to. So it, it, when we, I'll show you the uh, document that you might want to use as a bit of a guide, um, it, it it might be a bit overwhelming for some people, you know, executive functioning difficulties or you know additional uh, dyslexic type needs. So you might need someone, uh, a support person alongside, help helping you with these sorts of things. And then and then when you come up with the plan, distributing it to the right people. So getting it on your GP record, for example, or getting it on if you've got a social worker, getting it on that file, just so the right people know. Um, okay. How else can others help? So, so services. So, just to let people know, in case you know people haven't had any impact, uh, any input from services. Of course, services aren't perfect, and there's a long way to go in services, and they're definitely not set up um, yet to be uh, really conducive uh, for, for many autistic people. Of course, but just in case people didn't know, you know, you, as an autistic person, you're entitled to what's called a social care assessment of need. And you'd be able to access that through your um, local council website or ringing up your local council sort of social care department. Um, and then if you've got anyone in your life that is, is uh, supporting you uh, very regularly um, and with high frequency, then uh, they might be entitled to a carer's assessment as well. Um, so just, you know, many people might already know that, but just in case people didn't. Um, and again, just as I said earlier, you know, some people don't know that there's actually a, a sort of specific area of, of community mental health teams called older adults, um, which does look after people's uh, mental health, you know, in terms of depression, anxiety, suicidality, trauma, um, but also looks after people with, with declining cognitive function and, and dementia as well, oftentimes mixed up together, both the cognitive side of things and, and the mental health side of things. Um, and then we've got things like local charities, support groups, um, and activity groups. Um, I'll go into some options actually later. That I, don't, I wonder if people have had any experience with. Um, I'm just gonna. Oh, I suppose what what in terms of what else needs to be done. So we've got like how can family and friends help you? How might services help you? But there's a big a big gap. It like I said earlier is research. There's not enough research out there about what are the needs of older adults on the spectrum. Um, and how can we, uh, you know, develop services around, around these needs? Um, one way that you guys might want to get involved is in um, joining in with some research. So let me just, Linda mentioned the Newcastle study earlier on. Now, I had a quick look and it's still open. So there's this, um, this study called the Adult Autism Spectrum Cohort UK. That's a group, a group of people. It's made up by... Um, let me just share my screen with you. I keep forgetting to do that, don't I? I'm not very good on these uh, technology. Here we go. Can you see this? Adult Autism Spectrum Cohort. Um, so yeah, they're still recruiting people. Um, it's it's they're looking for sort of individuals to participate across the lifespan. 
Um, they're made up by this sort of working group here and also Autistica, who do a lot of research in autism and Newcastle University. And then you can just sort of click here to join the cohort and you'd enter your details. And I believe you just sort of fill in questionnaires about, about life experiences and things. And they do cover it across, across the lifespan. Um, if I just... The, the study that you mentioned, Linda, hasn't, hasn't, yeah, I double checked and it hasn't produced any results yet. It's specifically about older people. So the, the study itself is called Improving the Health of Old, Older Autistic People, started in 2017. Um, nothing's been released as yet. I wonder if the pandemic's had some impact on it. I don't know. I don't know. Um, but yeah, if people want to just keep an eye out for that, you know, hopefully um, in coming months, maybe something will be released and we'll have some results about what are the needs and what we need to prioritise for older autistic people. OK, um, I don't know if anyone's heard of the University of the Third Age. Um, it's something I came across on my. Um, it's something I came across on my older adult placement. Um, again, I just need to shift the screen I'm sharing two secs. So it's a national program and it helps people connect with groups um, across a whole host of interests um, in their local area. So if I just... So this is the University of the Third Age website. Um, it's called U3A, if you see in the top left there. Um, and it's just, I, I don't think it's not got any cutoffs around age or anything. So if you were someone who sort of considered yourself in that sort of aging category or, or like you said, Helen, you know, you, you get on better with, with older people um, and there's a better conversation to be had. You connect better with those sorts of individuals, then this might be a nice avenue for support. So what you can do is if you click on, where was it? Um, so if I've, I've just clicked on contact us and then there's a page called find U3A and then you click on the map and then you can sort of, so Northwest are all in yellow, for example. So I just zoom in and say, oh, okay, where are the ones near me? You know, they're sort of dotted around all across the Northwest. Um, if I was to, well, let's just, we're based in Chester, so I'll click on Chester as an example. Then you've got about, what here? So in Chester, they do things like bird watching, family history, German conversation, local history, music group, singing for pleasure, line dancing. You know, it's got such a lovely range of things to get to get involved with. If, if you, you know, you're someone that's struggling with, um, feeling disconnected from people, feeling dis disconnected from your community. This might be a really nice way of, of connecting with people locally. Um, so I'll just take that off now. And come back on this. Okay. So here we are now. This is the last little bit. So um, what we talked about earlier. Now, you might want to call this what it, you can call it whatever you like you know we've used the word advanced decision earlier there's also language like one page profile or a hospital passport or a health passport and it's essentially just a document that you you can include whatever you like like i'll show you a, a, a sort of guide in a minute but you could start from scratch on a word document on a piece of paper um you can do it on your own or with someone you trust and it's just a place of really getting down perhaps in a page or a few pages the, the most important things about you that people need to know should you end up in a caring environment. So things like what your likes are, your dislikes, your interests, your values. Um, describe to people what your neurodiversity is, whether that's autism on its own or with ADHD or with dyslexia, dyscalculia, you know, really getting your needs down. Also physical health needs, whether you've got, you know, joint and mobility problems, epilepsy, uh, mental health needs as well. But also getting down what your sensory needs are in your diet, how you communicate and, and what, what communication you require in return, um, whether you need like information repeated, whether you need things written down as well as communicated verbally, um, 
whether you need pictures as well as words, you know, whatever, whatever that is for you, whether, you know, some people, um, I don't know if people are familiar with uh, Jamie and Lyon. Um, he's a, he's a autistic advocate. He does lots of conferences and things, but he's also got a wonderful podcast called 1800 seconds on autism. I'd really recommend it. Um, but he talks very openly about when he loses his, when he's uh, during times of great stress and great anxiety, he loses his communication. He loses his ability to speak verbally. And then he needs to rely on sort of um, augmentative uh, methods. So whether that's using his phone to type, I think he does perhaps. Um, so, you know, maybe that's worth considering, you know, should I uh, feel really frozen and, and be unable to communicate verbally? What else have I got at my disposal and how can people help me? Um, what makes you feel safe in terms of routine and predictability? What is it you absolutely need to do every day, for example, in order to feel safe? Because getting that down could really make later life a much, a much safer place to be. Um, any other reasonable adjustments? Um, and like I say, it can be used in health settings, hospitals, the dentist, care homes, wherever you might end up. And if you get that on your GP record and social care record or wherever else are the sort of key places where it might be stored and distributed, and that might be a way of, of, of really sort of protecting you. So if um, I, I'll just show you an example. So can you can you see the presentation still? Or can you see the presentation, right? Um, okay, so this is an example of the hospital passport. It was, I can't remember the name of the person who developed it, but it was someone specifically in collaboration with the NAS. Um, and this is just an example. So you might have, you know, your, your personal your personal information, but you might not want to go by your, your formal legal name. You might have another name that you much prefer to, to prefer to go by. Um, your key relationships, who you want to be contacted in terms of your treatment and care. How I would like you to communicate with me and how I communicate. How I experience and communicate pain. You know, it, it's, I'm sure a lot of people on this group don't experience pain in the same way. Sometimes people might laugh in response to pain. Some people are very, very hyposensitive to pain. And, you know, we'll often talk with people about if there is that hyposensitivity, getting it on your medical records, because we don't want people being like deprioritized in medical settings because they seem all right. You know, they need to look out for other things to, to other indicators that you're okay or you're not okay. Anna? Yeah, I think we've, we've just got a hands up there from Helen. Lovely, yeah. Hello, Helen. Oh, I sorry to hog the airwave again. Sorry, <laughs> just going to say that um, I, I did this um, soon after I got my diagnosis with Axia. I filled in a um, DNR thing and uh, advanced directive and a and one of these health passport things. Or well, I say I did, but actually I found really really difficult um, for, forms I can kind of cope with in general. But when it came to talking about myself, my pain, and my, what I experienced and so forth, I couldn't do it. And I'm in a fortunate position where I'm seeing a therapist and actually we went through that and she was fantastic and I kind of just spoke stuff about and she wrote it down and we got it done I keep thinking about people who aren't in therapy and stuff and I'm wondering are there services to help people who can't access you know is there anything for people to access to help with form filling when you can't actually think about yourself in this way kind of you can't advocate for yourself Mm, mm, that yeah. don't who aren't you know who maybe don't need to go to see a therapist but could just do with some somebody to help them you know, is there anything available available for autistic adults yeah, in this that's sense? That's a really, really valid point, yeah, and something I'd not thought about. I mean, yeah, I was sort of saying earlier, it, it, great if you've got a professional like a therapist, but, you know, even just a family member or a friend or a partner might be able to help you out. But some people are so isolated, perhaps they don't even have that. And you're right, where where do those people go? Um, I, don't, I don't know if there is a service. Um, Perhaps someone like a social worker or a really helpful support worker might help. But again, not everybody has that, do they? Um, so, you know, people will be being missed. I think there's been a big drive recently, um, Helen. So, you know, people with a learning disability um, should have, there's been a big drive about um, annual health checks. So people with a learning disability should have an annual health check with their GP. And there's, for years and years, there's been big drivers around this about increasing this because people who can struggle to, you know, communicate their pain and their physical health needs need more monitoring externally. Um, and I think there's probably scope for that for many autistic people. Um, and perhaps something like that, if we, if we yeah, yeah. take around that, that might 
um, mm. identify people's needs a bit more. Yeah, one of the things was uh, I'm going into hospital soon, and um, sorry to, to, to add on to this. <laughs> so I'm going to hospital soon, probably, and um, and trying to find again my therapist's been helpful with this trying to find people who could advocate for me in that setting and so forth and one of the things that comes up is is the um a learning disability liaison kind of officer type person who would also help with autism it would probably come under the you know enough to, to be able to get some help there so just putting it out there if anybody else gets into that kind of situation yeah, that the yeah. hospitals usually have some kind of a person there that you might have to try and contact and no. <laughs> yeah 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 that's a really good point and and they're they're not thankfully they're not just about people with a learning disability often they're called learning disability and autism liaison nurse or something like that so yeah that's a really good point Helen um so that might be if anyone's got any planned visits to hospital or you could even get it documented if you've got um a form like that you could even have it documented if I end up in hospital I need access to the learning disability slash autism liaison person yeah, like if you really and if you find out the stuff in, the, in advance, you can actually contact them and make contact ahead of your appointment so that they know that you're coming in and stuff like that. So that's yeah. useful. Fantastic. Yeah, really, really good point. Yeah. So I'll, I'll leave that there with the with the document. If um, I'll just yeah. Sorry, sorry again. I think um, Michelle's got a hand up there as well. Yeah. Go ahead, Michelle. Um, yeah, I, I just want to say that I think um, in terms of research and pain management. I think a lot needs to be done when um, a person's artistic and as long term um, as like a long term health condition. Uh, twice I was told um, when I was um, heavily in labour with uh, both my girls that I couldn't possibly be in labour or experiencing contractions because I could talk um, through them and it's like I didn't know at the time I was autistic. I had no idea what autism was at that point. Um, but I did have um, Crohn's disease. My first daughter, that was undiagnosed too. And it's like trying to talk and continue in life when it feels like you're being turned inside out is kind of what you do on a day-to-day -day anyway. Mm. Oh, and I've also been turned down for hospital care because they didn't believe there was anything wrong with me because I was wearing makeup. So I just want to say that. <laughs> Right, word. Yeah, it's a long <laughs> way to go, isn't it, Michelle? No, it's yeah, just, yeah. just abhorrent. That, 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 ev that evening that I was uh, refused, um, I, I, went, I went on the Sunday, they got me an emergency doctor and the doctor says, well, you kind of look all right now, so I sent me home. Uh, because I had managed to stave off the pain long enough to put makeup on because I wouldn't go out of the house without makeup, even if I was really poorly. Mm. Um, and um, that evening, I ended up in hospital on drips and that. So I think there's a long way to go with people that, like you say, don't typically present um, in, in the usual fashion when it comes to pain, probably definitely. because they are more used to it. Yeah, definitely. And I think that, um, you know, things like that would be really important to get down on, on, a, on a document like what I've just shown. So you could have things like... You know, I, in, in the communication box, um, my, how I'm feeling doesn't really show on my face. So don't assume I'm okay because I'm smiling. You know, like there's all these very neurotypical understandings about how someone should present in different situations. Um, but I was also thinking just then, Michelle, you know, you've just said, I wouldn't leave the house without makeup. I'd be getting that down on my, on my form. I, I wouldn't leave it. And I don't want to be ending up in a care home where... Um, I can't put my makeup on myself and no one's helping me because I wouldn't feel like myself, you know? So that might be yeah. a really important thing to get down. That and I, yeah. want, I want support to look good because that helps me feel good. Yeah. And that could really also, impact someone's mental health, couldn't it? Well, also, another thing is the usual way is that um, if you feel like crap, you're going to look like crap. But for me, it's the other way. If I feel fine and my pain's um, all um, sorted out and my brain feels okay, then I can put on a baggy hoodie, no makeup, and I really don't care either way. But if I'm feeling ill or if I'm having a flare-up, I will put makeup on and make more of an effort because to me it's almost like it's, 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 faking, it's faking that you're well, that you feel good. 
So I think if again, if hospitals were more aware of that as well. Yeah, I think that's really, really good advice. And again, stuff I would get down on a document. If I look like this, this probably means. If I look like <laughs> yeah. this, this probably means. You know, like that will help people to understand. It's your own way yeah, of communicating, isn't it? What I look like is a way of, of communi- communicating. If if I'm wearing a cocktail dress, send me to A and E. Yeah, very good point. So anyone who wants that <laughs> hospital passport, um, then it's there. If you type in my hospital passport, me first, you'll, you'll find it and you can fill that in with the help of someone, obviously. So we'll go to Nathan next and then we'll start wrapping up if that's OK. Um, I was just going to say it's not related to a hospital visit as such, but a very we have if you work in the NHS uh, or it might just be my trust, I'm not sure. We have a very similar document not with the same questions but it's like a passport as at work so if I change role or department um it it goes with me and my files to explain what what help or adaptations I need at work and stuff like that yeah yeah fantastic and again that would be something you know we've talked about later life today Nathan um later life doesn't just mean when you retire you know you might be approaching later life and you might be very different as you're approaching retirement as you were when you were a spring chicken just starting your career, you know, so your reasonable adjustments across across your working life might be different. And um, so just keeping that updated, perhaps with, with your with your organisation is perhaps perhaps good advice. OK, thank you for everyone's contributions today. Is there any anything burning anyone wants to say before we say goodbye in a few minutes? I don't know if you want to, if you've seen what's in the chat, Hannah, there's, there's been a few messages in, if you wanted to look before we finish. I'll have a little look and see if I can add to anything. Oh my gosh. Yeah, broken, couldn't have possibly broken bones because I wasn't crying. Goodness me, yeah. So if, again, it's just super important, isn't it, to document how you might look when you're experiencing pain and um, and not to make assumptions. I am not neurotypical, therefore I won't communicate this in the same way as you do. Um, yeah. Damien Lyon describes getting a translation document for how he experiences pain. Yes, yes. Um, there's something about colour. Doesn't he describe colour? And it's, you know, maybe I, I haven't got this right, but something like a sharp pain might be a purple. But if it's a really sharp pain, it'd be a deep purple. If it's a slightly sharp pain, it's a, like a lilac or a light purple. So that's his way of, of communicating pain. So, you know, whatever it is for you individually, then just go with that and get it documented. And, and Jamie and Lyon, he's, he's, he's done that with the help of his support workers, I believe. But yeah, that's a really, really good shout, Amy. Thank you. OK, guys, so we'll wrap that up for today. I've really enjoyed Hello. getting this sort of... Oh, go on. Hi, Dream. Hello. Hello. I just want to say thank you very much. It was a very interesting talk. And as someone who is on the older side, I particularly resonated. I was still chuckling at the, the title Successful Aging. But the, the comment that you'd made about the minimizing disease and disability, that seems perfectly reasonable to me. But you might want to, or someone might want to add in the age-related disability. Because I do think we have a certain self-responsibility to look after ourselves um, we can't sort of just palm it off. So I think that that is important, but you do have to accept, you know, you dealt the cards that you're born with, but that sort of disability isn't related to the age aspect. Yeah. So I think if that was put in, and also I wanted to mention on the, the hormone thing that was mentioned with the, the females, I noticed in my mid forties, a decline in what I assume is testosterone which has had a, a perceptible difference. Now, that's going to be ageing. I don't know how it relates to autism, mm. but it is a noticeable change, sort of both cognitively, cognitively and sort of behaviourally. Yeah. So I just thought I wanted to bring that up, that I do think it's men as well as women that sort yeah. of have this hormonal change. Oh, and U3A, I got interested in that uh, in my mid-40s, and I was told I was too young. It's 50-plus. Ah, okay. Thank you. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Thanks for clarifying that, Dream. That's, that's brilliant. And yeah, some really important points. Yeah, there's again not enough research on like menopause and and autistic women. It's emerging, but yeah, there's of course hormonal stuff that goes on for men as well that's lagging behind. 
further. So yeah, again, highlighting another, another research gap. Okay, guys, so we'll wrap it up for today. Thank you for all of your contributions and for listen to, listening to me. Um, it's been a privilege spending this time with you today, and I hope to uh, join you again at some point in the future. Thanks a lot for that. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Hannah, and thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, just to let you know, our next session will be Wednesday, the 6th of October, um, and we'll let the same sort of time, and we'll let you know more information close to the time. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye.